evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night service. And uh, we're going to start by singing number 454, Follow On, and let's stand together and sing. Number 454, five, Follow On. And let's stand. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go Where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow Everywhere he leads me I will follow, follow on Walking in his footsteps till the crown be won Follow, follow, I will follow Jesus anywhere I will follow on, follow, follow, I will follow Jesus, everywhere he leads me I will follow on. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go, where the storms are sweeping and the dark waters flow. With his hand to lead me, I will never, never fear. Danger cannot frighten me if my Lord is near. Follow, follow, I will follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I will follow on. Follow, follow, I will follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me, I will follow on. Down in the valley or upon the mountain steep, close beside my Savior would my soul ever keep. He will lead me safely in the path that he has trod, up to where they gather on the hills of God. Follow. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you that we could to have 10 people gathered here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for those that are gathered around to watch at their homes, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we'll have a wonderful time singing these songs of praise to thee and a wonderful time in thy word. I pray that you'll bless in our service this evening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And anybody with a favorite? There's only like 10 of you, you know. <laughs> 189. 189. What one are you thinking? No, it's not. It's, it's uh, I'm not sure. If 187. 187 footsteps. Yeah, Amazing Grace. 187. Amazing Grace. So 187.
degrees when I went home for supper, so I turned on the heat to make sure we weren't cold in here, but uh, now it's too hot, so. <laughs> okay, at least for me it is. All right, 395, still sweeter every day. To Jesus every day I find my heart is closer drawn. He's fairer than the lily of the golden purple dawn. He's all my fancy pictures in his fairest dreams and more. Each day he grows so sweeter than he was the day before. The half cannot be fancied. This side, the golden shore. Oh, sweeter than he ever was before. His glory broke upon me when I saw him from afar. He's fairer than the lily, brighter than the morning star. He fills and satisfies my longing spirit o'er and o'er. Each day he grows so sweeter than he was the day before. The half cannot be fancied, this side the golden shore. Oh, there he'll be so sweeter than he ever was before. My heart is sometimes heavy, but he comes with sweet relief. He folds me to his bosom when I droop with blighting grief. I love the Christ to all my burdens in his body bore. Each day he grows still sweeter than he was the day before. The half cannot be fancied. This side, the golden shore. Oh. was before. Charles. 665, please. 665. 665, the 90 and 9. <clears throat> there were 90 and 9 that safely in the shelter of the fold. But one was out on the hills away, far off from the gates of gold. Away on 
But the shepherd made answer, This of mine has wandered away from me. And although the road be rough and steep, I go to the desert to find my sheep. I go that the Lord passed through ere he found his sheep that was lost. Out in the desert he heard its cry, sick and helpless and ready to die, sick and helpless and ready to Six hundred and ninety-five. Six nine five. Meet me there. Where the 
faithful heart no more meet me there. Where the harps of angels ring and the blessed forever sing in the palace of the king, meet me there. Where in sweet communion blend heart with heart and friend with friend in a word that ne'er shall end, meet me Faith has her hand up. Three, four, four, three hundred. Whose favorite song? Dan's favorite song. Yes, I didn't know that that Sunday morning we sang all his favorites. We just had sung it the week before. <laughs> didn't know it was his absolute favorite. I knew it was one he really liked. Though. Three, four, four. Brother Dan's favorite song. Three, four, four. Three, four, four. It's a good batting average. Three for four. Satisfied. All my life long I had panted for a draught from some cool spring that I hoped would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within. Hallelujah, I have found him. to be gathered together. Thank you, Lord, for these songs of praise that we got to sing to our wonderful Savior. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus satisfies the soul. Mm -hmm. And I pray, Lord, that if there's someone that, um, someone that's looking for satisfaction, trying to find something in this world to, um, to meet the need of their soul tonight, I pray that they'll look to Jesus. Pray that they'll see that Jesus satisfies and that they'll put their faith and trust in him and come to him for the forgiveness of sins and find Peace with God. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, for your announcements this evening, uh, just a reminder to, uh, to attend the services as best you can. Right now, we're still, as long as they, I'm really praying that they uh, open us up soon, but you never know what's going to happen the next day. So we're just, as long as this is how it is, we're going to continue with Wednesday night being recorded on Tuesday night, and then uh, Sunday night being recorded on Friday morning, and then um, Sunday morning have the drive-in service where we get to see one another. And so uh, we'll keep going that way. I found out what was wrong this past Sunday morning why I couldn't get it on your, ra on your radios. It was that I just needed to restart the app on my phone. <laughs> it was such a simple fix. If I just had a thought to do that. So anyways, the app had stopped working on me was all it was. So anyways, um, other than that, um, just let me know if you'd like to come to a service. We'd love to have you. Um, obviously, 10 spots fills up pretty quick. And so, uh, and so make sure you write your name down, let me know that you'd like to come to one, and uh, we'd love to get you in for one of the services. This Friday morning, we've already got nine out of the 10 filled, so uh, there's only one spot left for Friday morning. So uh, if you like that spot, let me know, but otherwise we'll plan on another time for you. So just let me know and we'll get you scheduled in. Uh, let's take our Bibles tonight and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. When you find your spot, let's stand for the reading of God's word. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And tonight we're concluding this chapter as we've been going through 2 Corinthians. Tonight we'll be looking at the heart of meekness, and or a meek heart. And tonight is the second part of that message, or of this chapter, as we look at the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So we'll start our reading tonight in verse, we'll read verse 1, and then we'll skip all the way down to verse number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Now I beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. So he's beseeching them by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And then in verse number 12 we read, For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our role abundantly, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Mm. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Mm. Let's ask the Lord to bless the reading of his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this passage of scripture that's before us this evening. Thank you, Lord, for uh, inspiring it all those years ago. Thank you, Lord, for preserving it. And I pray that as we consider it this evening and look at the example of the Apostle Paul and uh, the measure of Paul this evening, I ask, Lord, that first of all, that you'll fill me with your spirit, Lord, to preach your word. I pray that it will be understandable to everyone. And I pray, Lord, that it will be applicable to everyone to help them in their Christian life. And I pray, Lord, that if there is someone that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, I pray that that one will be saved through the preaching of thy word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you for standing for the reading of God's Word. Uh, so tonight we're concluding this two-part message on chapter 10, and we're going through 2 Corinthians, and we've been seeing the heart of a preacher in the first seven chapters of this book. 
Uh, the Apostle Paul laid open his motives. He laid bare his heart, his integrity, as he showed them the uh, pureness of his ministry. In chapters 8 and 9, then, he encouraged these believers to give. And we saw in those passages his giving heart as he uh, spoke to them of the great need of the churches at Jerusalem. But now... As we begin this week, in the, as we began last week in these closing chapters, Paul isn't dealing with, like, you know, just everybody in the church. He's specifically looking at those ones that are his adversaries. He's specifically dealing with those who are the false teachers, those who are raising the division and the strife in the church at Corinth, those who have falsely accused him, those who have undermined his ministry. And in these chapters, Paul is dealing with them because he must deal with them. You know, it's not that Paul is all about himself in this book. It's that if he doesn't take the time to deal with this, to deal with these adversaries, then his whole ministry, his whole work for Christ will be affected, uh, will be, uh, will be, um, tarnish, you might say, by uh, what these people are saying about him and how they are treating him and his ministry. And so he's got to take the time in chapters 10 to 13 to deal with these false, cha these false teachers. But what I want you to notice in chapter 10 specifically is how he does it with the spirit of meekness. He doesn't just come at them and just... Um, and just run them over, although he is, get, does get very uh, excited, you might say, as you read chapters 10 to 13. But at the very beginning, when he begins to address them, he beseeches them by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. He comes to them meekly. What is meekness? We saw last week. Meekness isn't weakness. Meekness is simply power under control. The, uh, the false accusers, uh, they're questioning Paul's authority. They're saying, Paul, you're weak. They're saying, Paul, you're, you're bold in your letters, but in presence, you're base among us. They're saying, Paul, your letters are weighty and powerful, but your bodily presence is weak and your speech is contemptible. And they're questioning his authority. But Paul's response isn't, is to the contrary. I beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I'm not weak, I'm meek. I'm not incapable of addressing this issue in person, in person. but I'm beseeching you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, mm -hmm. beseeching you to have a right heart so that when I come, I won't have to be bold among you. Because if I have to be, I can be. And he's not weak. He's meek. And so we've started examining this chapter last week, and we saw two things. First, we saw his power. He showed his power, and it's the power of taking the gospel into the world, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Paul had the power of the gospel, the power of the Spirit, as he preached the word. We saw his power last week. We saw his authority. You might have your letters of recommendation that you boast of, and that was seen, I think, in chapter 3. They had letters of commendation. These false accusers did. But Paul says, I don't need to boast of my authority, but just so you know, my authority is from Christ. My authority is directly from the Lord. He's my authority here, and that I will use once again, if I have to. And his meekness was seen as he reveals his power and his authority, but in his reluctance to use it. He'll use it if he has to, but first he beseeches them by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And so tonight as we conclude this chapter, we see the measure of Paul, the measure of his ministry. And uh, before we get into this text, let's just make sure that we understand what we're talking about when we talk about his measure, the measure of Paul. 
The word measure is from the Greek word metros, which obviously is where we get our word meter from. The idea of measuring something. And uh, here we are speaking of the measuring of Paul's ministry. We're measuring it. But we're not measuring it how you and I would measure it, you know? We'd measure it. We'd say, well, how, how, uh, how many, what's the number of souls saved? What's, what's the eloquence of his speech? What, what's, the, what's his programs? What's the size of his churches? What's the amount of money that's been received through his ministries? That's how people would look at things like that. And they measure Paul's ministry. That's not what we're looking at when we look to the Bible and we see the measure of Paul. What we're looking at here tonight is we're looking at the allotment, the lines, the specific area of ministry that God has given to him. That will come out as we look at this text. The word measure as used in these verses is referring to the lines, the boundaries of your measure. It's the idea of the lines of your field, that, that area that belongs to you. Or in Paul's case, he's still speaking of his authority. He's speaking of the scope of his authority, the area of his influence. And you see, Paul is still dealing with these people who are questioning his authority in Corinth. And evidently, some have come in and they've tried to usurp that authority. They've tried to gain a following of the Corinthians and to turn them from the truth. They were Judaizers and they were trying to bring the law into the church and they're trying to throw away Paul and Paul's authority there. And Paul was having to deal with them and their claim on authority. And of course, he deals with it with the spirit of meekness. So tonight, your big Roman numeral three, the first blank for you, is the measure of Paul. The measure of Paul. We're looking tonight at his heart of meekness by his measure. The measure of Paul. And as we look at his measure, I want you to see, number one, that it's a measure of grace. A measure of grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure. But according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. It's the measure. Here are people that he's addressing that are boasting of their measure. Boasting of what their authority is. Boasting of what they're doing. Boasting of their works. And I want you to note, number one here, that your measure is nothing to brag about. It's nothing to brag about. I wonder this evening if you can think of something that you just wouldn't even dare to do. I wouldn't even dare to do it. If someone could say, I dare you to, and you know how teenagers are. They, if someone dares them to do it, well, then they have to do it. There's no choice there. I was dared. Don't you understand that? Someone dared me to do it, so of course I got to jump off the bridge or whatever it is. Somebody dared me to do it. Listen, that's a, that's a culture that teenagers have to overcome. <laughs> that's something that teenagers need to, need to learn. Christian teenagers, I hope that's not you. I hope you have some standards where even if you're dared to do it, even if your best friend dares you, even if your preacher were to dare you, I hope that uh, you refuse to do something that goes against your Christian virtues or anything foolish. I hope you don't just do anything that you're dared to do. And Paul in the text, his first three words are, for we dare not. We dare not. First four words, sorry. For we dare not. What is it that Paul, even if you were to dare him to do it, he wouldn't do it. Paul, he, even if you dared him, he wouldn't commend himself. Even if you dared him to. Paul, say something good about yourself. Paul, why don't you tell us about how great you are? Paul, why don't you tell us about something about Paul and, and how wonderful Paul is? Paul says, no, I won't do that. We dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. Even if you dare me, I'm not going to commend myself. 
Even if you dare me, I, I'm not going to get into this competition of comparing myself with others. He wasn't going to do it. He wasn't going to brag on himself. He wouldn't compare himself with others to commend himself. He wouldn't brag on himself. Even if you dared him, he wouldn't do it. Evidently, Paul's dealing with these adversary, adversaries who happen to think a lot of themselves. You know what I mean? Have you met someone like that? They seem to think that they're all that and they have all the answers and they're something great. They're prideful men. They, they're men who claim to have done great things, who have their letters of recommendation and they claim to have great authority and they boast of themselves. They lift themselves up while they put down others. And they're elevated in their own minds and they're attempting to usurp the authority at the church at Corinth. And how they must have degraded Paul. You read it in the text, what they said of him. They said his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. How would you like it if someone said that about you? How would you like it if you say, man, that person, his speech is contemptible. I can't stand it when he talks. I can't stand the way that guy gets up there and speaks. I, I can't stand that guy's bodily presence. It's just weak. He looks like a weak man. How would you like that? I mean, it, it would probably make your blood boil, wouldn't it? It would make you want to fight back. That's how we'd feel. We'd want to give them a piece of our mind. We want to point out their flaws and lift ourselves up and do something about it. Of course, that's what we want to do. But Paul wouldn't dare. He wouldn't dare. It's like he was being dared, and he wouldn't even, being dared, he still wouldn't enter into that fight. He never entered into that conflict. Join that discussion of commending himself and putting himself up in order to put someone else down. It's something he dared not to do. His boast was only in Jesus Christ. He wasn't boasting in Paul. He wasn't boasting in who he was. He wouldn't even dare to brag about himself and his measure. Can I tell you something? A meek man, he never would. A meek man doesn't get caught up in that spirit of boasting. This is showing Paul's meekness all over again. They're attacking him, slandering his, his, his character, slandering his ability, slandering his authority, slandering his person. And Paul, as a meek man, refuses to get caught up in all of that. He boasts only in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he realizes that his measure, his, what God has called him to do, it's nothing to boast about. He says it's nothing to brag about. But number two, he points out that these ones that are doing this, they're using the wrong measure or the wrong measuring stick. They're using the wrong measuring stick. He says, We dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. They're not right, wise. Why aren't they wise? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that you're, you're using the wrong measuring stick. They're looking at each other and comparing themselves to each other. They're lifting themselves up while putting others down, commending themselves, feeling that they themselves, next to others, that they look pretty good. But our measuring stick isn't people. Our measuring stick is supposed to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were using the wrong measuring stick. Listen, if we set our own standard, we can all find some standard that makes us look good, can't we? It's not our standard that matters, it's God's standard. What standard are you using today? I love this story, the story of, a, of two brothers, and they were both well known around the town for their crooked business dealings and their underworld connections. And they were as mean and as cold-blooded as you could imagine. And eventually one of them died. And uh, the, the other brother wanted to give his dead brother a funeral that was fit for a king. And so he called the funeral home and he made all the arrangements. Then he called the minister and made him an offer. He said, I'll give you $10,000 to put that new roof on the church, you know, if you eulogize my brother and call him a saint. 
and the minister agreed. And so the whole town turned out for the funeral, and the minister began. The man you see in the coffin was a vile and corrupt individual. He was a liar, a thief, a deceiver, a manipulator, a reprobate, and a pleasure seeker. He destroyed the fortunes, careers, and lives of countless people in this city, some of whom are here today. This man did every dirty, rotten thing you can think of. But, compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> you know, you can all find somebody. who, Next to them, I look pretty good. Next to them, I, I come out uh, measuring up pretty well. But let me remind you that you're using the wrong measuring stick. These braggers were comparing themselves against themselves, against other flawed individuals. And they had nothing to brag about. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned, all have come short, not measured up to the glory of God. And we have nothing to talk, to boast of when we talk of our measure. And Paul reminds us in verse 13 that it's all of grace. It's all of grace. He says there, but we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. In other words, we're not going to boast of these things. We're not going to just tell of things that we didn't do or make or just compare ourselves with others. We're not getting into that. What we'll tell you is what God's allowed us to do will tell you of the measure of the rule, the boundaries as we were talking about, the ministry that God has distributed to us. That's what we'll talk to you about. And it reminds us that his ministry, the measure that he had, was simply the measure that God had given him. It wasn't uh, because Paul had earned it. It wasn't because Paul, because Paul was some wonder what was some super duper no it was simply the grace of god it was god's amazing grace and you know when it comes to our gifts when it comes to our measure when it comes to what god has called us to do it's all by god's grace it's by god's grace that we're able to do anything for him turn to first peter chapter four. First peter chapter four and we'll read a few verses there Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, chapter 4 of 1st Peter. It says in verse 10, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Mm -hmm. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's all of grace. Everything we do is by the grace of God. Some preachers, some Christians might get caught up, you know, in the numbers. How many people are coming to the services? Well, ten people, that's good. <laughs> I'm happy to have ten. Um, <laughs> I'd like to have more, but you know, how many members, how many decisions, how many, and measure themselves that way. And while we get that the early church kept track of the numbers, they counted them. On the day of Pentecost, there was 120 in that room, then 5,000 or 3,000 got saved, then there were 5,000 or 5,000 more, however you count it. But they kept track of it all, and all to the glory of God. And we keep track of that kind of thing. But it's foolish to brag about it because it's all by God's grace. It's foolish to think that this is something for us to glory in for glory in ourselves. Because let's face it, what do we have apart from the grace of God? 1 Corinthians 4.7 1 Corinthians 4.7 says, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? 
What do you have that's not from God, eh? Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. When we think of the measure that we have, it's a measure of grace. It's what God has given us, what God has distributed to us. That's the measure that we have. And so Paul, he says, we're just talk of the measure that God has distributed to us in verse number 13. Then we see big Roman numeral, or big letter B, I guess, with this outline this evening. Big letter B, we see a measure, not just of grace, but a measure of faith. A measure of faith. Um, in these verses, verses 14 to 16, Paul is now defining the bounds of his ministry. Look at what he says. He says, For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by, the, uh, by, by you according to the rule, our rule abundantly to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. In these verses, he's defining the bounds of his ministry. It's addressing some who say that he, he has no authority in Corinth, you know. Uh, God has given, but he says, God's given me a measure to reach even to you. Paul, Paul being in Corinth, he's not stretching himself beyond his measure. Uh, he's not someone there who shouldn't be there. In other words, he's saying, God sent me to Corinth. God led me there. God led me to preach the gospel there. He was there in accordance with the will of God. He was there according to his measure of grace. And also we'll call it his measure of faith. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And verse number 3. Romans 12 verse 3. It says there, For I say, notice this, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt, notice this, to every man the measure of faith. So we see it's a measure of grace. He's speaking by the grace given to him. And now he's talking about faith. That every man, uh, according, God's dealt to every man the measure of faith. Verse 6 says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. And so we're thinking of Paul's ministry in our message this evening, but how it relates to us really is in the spiritual gifts, is in what God has gifted us to do and the grace that he's bestowed upon us. God has given us grace. He's given us gifts. And then we're to use them by faith. We're to use them in the proportion of faith that he has given to us. And uh, even... Paul's measure when it came to his going to Corinth as a missionary was by grace according to his measure of faith. And as you look at our text back in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, you understand that Paul is wanting to do more. Do you see that? He's reached to Corinth. He, he's gotten the gospel there. But he says in this, these verses, not boasting of things, verse 15, without our measure, that is of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. He wants that measure, that rule, that boundary of his ministry enlarged. Why? To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. And not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. He wanted to go somewhere where no missionary had gone before. That was Paul's heart. He wanted to take the gospel to those who had never heard. He had done that in Corinth. He had done that in Philippi. He had done that in Ephesus and Thessalonica. He had done that in the cities of Galatia. He had done that in all these places. And he wanted to go further. How would he do that? By grace through faith. It's a measure of grace, but he had faith that God would increase his measure. 
And he says to the Corinthians, literally, this would have happened already if just waiting for your faith to increase. Right now, I'm kind of stuck dealing with you guys. I'm a missionary. Like, this, this isn't a pastor speaking to his church. This is the apostle speaking to the church. He's speaking to people where he, he planted the church, and now he's, he's feeling the call to go further and take the gospel to more places. But the Corinthians are having so many problems. Their faith is so small, you might say, that it's uh, affecting his ability to do more for the Lord. And uh, he's waiting, he has faith for the day that he'll get to preach the gospel in the regions beyond them and take it even further than it had gone before. And friend, do you want to do more for the Lord than what you're already doing? You say, I have a, I'm already doing a lot. You know, I have a measure. I believe every, every Christian has a measure of faith, right? Every Christian has a measure of grace. God's given us all something to do for him. He's given us all, made us all part of the body of Christ, all part of the church. And he, there's a work for us all to do. And I trust that you're doing it. I trust that you're laboring by grace through faith, laboring for the Lord. But where is the Jabez of today? You know who Jabez was in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10? We bought, the Bible tells us of Jabez. Do you remember what he prayed? It says in 1 Chronicles 4, 10, And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast. And that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And then it says, And God granted him that which he requested. Mm -hmm. The first thing he requested there was that God would enlarge his coast. And God did it. That's what Paul was praying for here. He was praying that God would enlarge his coast. He's already reached these places with the gospel. He wants to reach more. He wants to do more. He wants to take the gospel further. And God's given us all the work to do. And praise the Lord that we're able to join, be co-laborers together with the Lord. And by faith, we can ask, Lord, can I do something else? Lord, can I do more for you? What else would you have me to do, Lord? Just like Paul was this evening. It was the measure, not just of grace, but the measure of faith. Seeing, wanting their faith to increase. And of course, if our faith increases, we can do more for the Lord. A measure of grace and a measure of faith. Now one more thing this evening. We see that the measure we're talking of is the measure of Christ. The measure of Christ. Verse 17. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. What's our measure? What's the only thing we're to boast in? What's, who are we to glory in? We're to glory in Christ. Glory in the Lord. You know why Paul wouldn't boast in himself? Because he had his eyes on the Lord. The Lord was his measuring stick. The Lord was the one he was focused on. And he could only glory in Christ. And you look at Ephesians chapter 4, thinking of our measuring and our measuring stick. Consider what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4. Verse number 7, it says, But unto everyone is given grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. That's Ephesians 4, verse 7. Read down a few verses down further in verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, notice this, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God onto a perfect man, onto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What's the measure? What's a perfect man? Someone who's onto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What's our measuring stick? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Paul concludes chapter 10, he reminds us that it's Christ. He's the only one that we have to glory in. 
Don't look at your own measuring sticks and look around at the other measuring sticks and glory in yourself. Get your eyes on the Lord. Realize that it's all about Him because we've all fallen short. We've all fallen short. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all fallen short of the measuring stick of Jesus. And God is imploring us to get our eyes off of ourselves and get them on him. Glory in who he is. That's why Paul says, I dare not. I'm not going to get into this boasting of myself. There's nothing in me to boast of. I boast in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that I'm excited about. He's the one that's done the work. He's the one that saved my poor wicked soul. My boast is in him. He was glorying in Christ. This isn't the first time, this isn't the only time that Paul's dealt with people who are glorying in the wrong things. Dealt with these Judaizers. He dealt with them in Galatians as well. There they were, glorying in the flesh. And Paul said there, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. What are you glorying in today? Are you glorying in your own flesh, in your own works, and what you think you've accomplished or made yourself to be? Or are you glorying in the cross of Jesus? And Paul concludes this passage with that sobering reminder. For not he that commendeth himself is approved by whom the Lord commendeth. Not he that commendeth himself is approved by whom the Lord commendeth. A lot of people have a lot of good things to, to say about themselves. Man will proclaim, every man will proclaim his own goodness, the Bible says, but a faithful man who can find. A lot of people have a lot of good things to say about themselves. And I'm sure you're like me and you get tired of hearing it, you know? You get tired of hearing that person who just wants to talk about themselves and talk about what they do and brag on themselves. We mentioned that on Sunday night, uh, what D.L. Moody said about this. When speaking of salvation by grace, he said, It's well that man can't save himself, for if a man only could work his own way to heaven, you'd never hear the last of it. Why, if a man happens to get a, le a little ahead of his fellows, and scrapes a few thousands of dollars together. You'll hear him boast of being a self-made man. I've heard so much of this sort of talk that I'm sick and tired of the whole business, and I'm glad that through all eternity in heaven, we will never hear anyone bragging of how he worked his way to get there. <laughs> no, it's not what we say about ourselves that matters. It's what does the Lord say? What's, what's his opinion of me? Because his opinion is the only one that matters. In my own devotions, I've been going through the book of Kings, the first and second Kings. And, you know, you read of these kings and they had, they were kings for starters. I mean, that in and of itself would make it so that the person in the world looking at them would say, look, he's the king. You realize that a king like Ahab, he had a, a house of ivory. I wonder how much that costs. <laughs> wonder how, how wealthy he must have been to have a house of ivory. Uh, the Bible tells us how Ahab actually had, uh, had some great battles, one where God helped him, and the Syrians said he's not the God of the mountains or the hills or something. He's the God of the hills, but not of the valley. And so they said, we can take him. And they saw how God defended even Ahab, and he won victories against the Syrians. And someone might look at all that and say, wow, what a good guy, what a good king. Except, what does the Lord say? There was none like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. What a terrible obituary. What a terrible thing to be written on your tombstone. For all eternity, we'll remember that about King Ahab. These other kings, they come and they go, and you read about them, and there's only one line in their life that really it matters. It's, did he set his heart to seek the Lord, or was he evil in the sight of the Lord? What does God have to say about them? I've often wondered if, you know, we lived in Bible times and our lives were written down like that and we got to read that one sentence of our life, what would it say? Would it say he prepared his heart to seek the Lord or would it say he did evil in the eyes of the Lord? Ask yourself that question. Are you seeking the Lord with your life? Because friend, that's all that matters. 
All that matters is who the Lord commends. Not who men commend, but whom the Lord commended. And ultimately, we all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give account of what we've done with our lives, whether good or bad. What does the Lord have to say? And that day, that will be all that matters, won't it? Mm. Have you given that much thought? This chapter reminds us that's, that's the measuring stick. It's not other people. It's not, well, I was, I was good next to that guy. Yeah, well, that guy was terrible. <laughs> I was good compared to him. Yeah, well, that guy, his faults are obvious to us all too. What about compared to God's measuring stick? Are you seeking your heart to please the Lord? Setting your heart to please the Lord. Seeking Him, doing right in the eyes of the Lord. Chapter 10 is the chapter of a meek man. We see the Apostle Paul as being a meek heart. He's lowly in heart, not throwing his weight around. Although God's given him power, given him authority, giving him a measure even to reach to Corinth, he's still beseeching them by the gentleness and meekness of the Lord Jesus Christ, beseeching them to get their hearts right with God and to humble themselves before him. Mm-hmm. Friend, what about you? What about me? God implores us to walk humbly with our God, to not be lifted up in pride, not get caught up in this boasting that this world has, but to just glory. If any man glories, let him glory in the Lord. What are you glorying in today? I trust that you're glorying in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text that was before us. Thank you, Lord, for Paul's meekness and how you used him to reach the church at Corinth. And I pray, Lord, that we will endeavor to to be like that. We'll follow him as he followed Christ. And I pray that we will have that spirit of meekness as we labor for the Savior. Pray to help us, Lord, to be like Jesus, to be gentle, to be meek. Do be bold, though, when we have to be, Lord, but to be the Christian that you'd have us to be. Mm. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Mm. Well, thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, We're going to have a prayer time here in just a minute. But before we do that, I'll just run through some things on the prayer list. Um, Just still be in prayer for the funeral arrangements for our brother Dan. So the, there's paperwork and things that need to be taken care of that were taken care of yesterday by the hospital and then we're going to go through a public trustee and the public trustee is going to take care of everything and be, work with us to arrange a funeral and things like that. So that hasn't happened yet, but uh, it should happen, should be arranged at least by the end of this week. So be in prayer for that. And um, other than that, there's... Um, I want you to pray for my brother, Mark. My brother, Mark, his wife's having a baby in like a week and a half is the due date. And uh, my brother, Mark, stubbed his toe and broke his baby toe just the other day. And uh, it's just it's a little baby toe is just sideways there. And they were going to put a cast on him all the way up to his knee. And he said, but my wife's having a baby in two weeks. And so they taped it together and he has an appointment tomorrow, which is today for, he's already had the appointment by the time you see this video with the orthopedic surgeon to see if they are going to need to operate on his toe. So uh, pray for Mark, he's a, I don't know, the two of them, he said the two of us must be quite a pair walking along because you know she's nine months pregnant and she's got a broken toe. So anyways, you shouldn't laugh, but uh, pray for my brother Mark and for his wife Blaney as she's due any time now. And, um, and uh, other than that, there's nothing really to update you on. Stephen made it safely back to Toronto today, uh, on Tuesday. So yesterday, he made it safely back. And so pray for him. He's starting his employment there. Uh, and so pray for him as he's taking this next venture in his life. And um, other than that, I don't see anything else that I need to update you on. So I'll look to Lord in prayer, and then we'll have a prayer time here. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the time we've had in your house this evening. Thank you, Lord, for those able to tune in on, uh, on Facebook and YouTube and on the church website. And I pray, Lord, that it will have been an encouragement to them. And I pray, Lord, that soon we'll be able to have uh, a lot more people in the services, Lord. I pray that we'll be able to have all our people into the services and that we'll just have you blessed in that way. And I ask, Lord, that uh, you'll open the doors back up again and that we'll 
have no restrictions. And thank you, Lord, for the good news in Nova Scotia that is as of Tuesday, we've gone a whole week without a new case. And thank you, Lord, for that. And I pray, Lord, that uh, we'll, um, we'll just, uh, just keep trusting you day by day with each step of the way, Lord. And pray that you'll help us, Lord, to keep our faith and keep our eyes fixed on thee. Pray, Lord, for... Um, I pray, Lord, for our... Uh, for our children's ministry, Lord, as we're unable to, to see them these days, I just ask, Lord, that you'll encourage each of the kids, Lord. Pray, Lord, that the letters that we send them and the different things in the mail, that there'll be encouragement to them. And I pray, Lord, that uh, um, you'll just take care of them through this uh, through this time. Pray, Lord, for um, pray, Lord, for the funeral arrangements for Brother Dan, that everything will be taken care of there, and that. Uh, We'll soon have a, a, a plan, Lord, for his burial and the service, Lord, and different things. And pray that we'll be able to have a, a service in the future for his sister to be able to make it down. And pray that the travel restrictions will ease up at, at some point for that to happen, Lord, so that uh, she can travel into the province for service for her brother. I pray, Lord, for um, uh, just for each one on our list, Lord, as we got many that are ill, many that need to... Uh, Special prayer, Lord. I pray that you will just minister to each of their needs, Lord, and to help them. I pray, Lord, for my brother Mark and his wife Lainey. I pray, Lord, for them as they got these health needs at this time. One of them's pregnant, due any day, and the other one broke his toe. Just ask, Lord, that uh, you'll help my brother to heal, and I pray that uh, you'll be with the baby as the, as, she, as the birth happens, Lord, and pray, Lord, for their spiritual needs, Lord. Pray that they'll uh, put their faith and trust in Jesus as their Savior. Pray, Lord, for um, Stephen, Lord. Thank you that he made it back to Toronto today. Just ask that you will um, bless him, his heart and life and encourage him, Lord, as he begins this next chapter in his life, uh, working there. And I pray that you'll meet his needs. And I pray, Lord, for our church family, Lord, as we're not able to see each other, just pray for each one, that you'll encourage them at this time and meet their needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.